Welcome to our Heritage Talk. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, exploring the archaeology of the American Civil War without leaving Britain. Part one explores the discovery of the wreckage with our speaker, senior marine archaeologist, Graeme Scott. Thank you, Jenny. This talk is as much about a historical story as it is about an underwater archaeological site. It'll include a shipwreck, a disaster and tragedy, a modern discovery, a Hollywood superstar, and will, I hope, reflect upon the role that the city my family comes from played in supporting enslavement many years after it was abolished in Britain. It is January 1865. Imagine yourself as this man, Captain Arthur Sinclair. You are American. You have been in the great port of Liverpool for several months. You're awaiting a new ship, the Lelia, named after your wife. Built by William Miller and Sons in their yard at Toxteth on the Mersey Riverfront. Uh, you can see uh, the Mersey Riverfront and Toxteth is over towards this side. No traces of the yard that the lady was built in appear to re remain now. The ship is being made ready for the voyage and you're under pressure to get it re ready for sea and across the Atlantic. As a result, things are being rushed, but needs must, you are in a hurry. On the 14th, you consult with Captain Skinner, who's the official captain of your ship, because although you are really in charge, you are one of six registered passengers and you decide to sail. Others are surprised. The weather looks set to turn, but you cannot afford to wait. Thomas Miller, the son of the shipbuilder, is on board to assess the new ship's performance for the first part of the voyage. Steaming out the Mersey estuary and into Liverpool Bay, the conditions start getting rough. You see uh, an old chart here of uh, the Mersey on the right hand side, and this is Liverpool Bay. The crew, perhaps not the best, but you couldn't exactly afford to be fussy, could you? Struggle to get the port anchor in board. The inquiry into the loss of your ship will subsequently hear evidence that they leave a hatch in the side of the bow open. You head along the North Wales coast until the full force of an Irish sea storm hits your low freeboard. Your ship is small and when heavily loaded like it is today, sits very low in the water. Waves crashing against your bow rush through the open hatch, in and out, pounding everything on deck and washing away everything loose. The plank hatch cover of your forward cargo hold is held by wooden battens and is very vulnerable. Perhaps someone has been careless because eventually the force of the waves crashing through rips the cover off and water cascades into your hold. That is not good. And you start to regret your impatience to leave port. It is impossible to go out on, on the deck to secure the hatch, so there's nothing else that you can do but turn around and try to make it back to Liverpool. Captain Skinner makes the turn and the ship struggles on, still unfortunately flooding and now worryingly low in the water. Eventually, the water reaches the boiler room the boiler room produces the steam that your engines rely on. The coal fires of the boilers are put out and the engines stop. Your ship is now at the mercy of the sea and helpless. The waves knock it beam on across the path of the monstrously steep waves that the sea here is notorious for. And things are getting desperate. And Captain Skinner does the only thing he can and gives the order to abandon ship. 
Lifeboats are launched, but are carried away by the waves. Men die. Captain Skinner stays with his ship. He is not seen again. A few survivors struggle to a light ship to await rescue. But the tragedy, unfortunately, is not over. Liverpool lifeboat number one is rowed out to pick up the survivors, but overturns under tow. The men on board work at sea, and therefore refuse to wear life jackets, so they all die. You yourself are dead, drowned by your reckless haste. So is Thomas Miller. You are buried in Fleetwood, close to where your body is later recovered by a fishing boat and where your grave can still be seen. You're an ocean away from home because you are not a British sea captain. You're an officer in the Confederate Navy and the death trap that killed you is a Confederate ship. Now another man enters our archaeological tale, this time in the late 20th century. This is Chris Michael, a Liverpool University physics professor. Chris is a keen diver and wreck investigator. He has a mystery to solve. Liverpool Bay is littered with historic shipwrecks that ships have sunk in the past without trace or in circumstances that make it difficult to know where exactly their wrecks will be on the seabed. He has one of those ships, but he thinks he knows what it is. His patience is rewarded and eventually he finds the ship's bell, which is inscribed with the name of the ship and the date 1864. He's right, he has found Valeria. You can see here where Valeria is, this little mark here. So well out into Liverpool Bay. Eventually in 2016, Wessex archaeology hears of this and tells Historic England that there is an interesting shipwreck in England's territorial waters off Liverpool. They decide to investigate and ask us to research and dive the wreck and then tell them how important it is. As a result of the advice they get from us, after we've researched and dived, you can see one of our divers here, you can see just how cumbersome the working kit you have to wear in order to dive safely is. After they get that advice from us, the UK government decides to schedule the wreck on the basis of its importance. So why have they taken this decision? What was the Lelia? What was it doing on that fateful day in 1865? Why am I using an archaeological site in Britain to talk about the American Civil War? To answer this, it is instructive to turn to the archaeology of the ship and the surveys that have been done of the wreck. Underwater archaeology is not a particularly well-funded discipline, and to make the most of our limited budgets, we often reuse data collected by others. In this case, we supplemented our own diving survey with data collected by Chris Michael, with data collected by St Andrews University, archaeologists shortly after the wreck was discovered and with this survey data collected by a former Mersey-based marine geophysical survey company called Bibi Hydromap. It is multi-beam survey data that you can see here. Multi-beam equipment uses pulses of sound to create a 3D map of the shape of the seabed. The time taken for individual pings of sound to travel from the survey ship to the seabed and back is measured. Because we know the speed of sound through water, we can tell how far the pink has traveled and thus the depth of the seabed below. Multibeam sends out multiple beams or pings at once in a wide swath, which creates a very detailed topographical map of the seabed and of the wreck sitting on, us, on it. This is a multi-beam scan of the Lelia, prepared by our friends at the survey company. And here is a plan view. The 
The colors on the right are a depth scale. So you can see that red is shallowest and blue is deepest. So what does this image tell us about what type of vessel the Lelio was and what it was intended to do? Well, first of all, it doesn't look much like a ship, does it? That's because corrosion, heavy trawling, and also time have taken their toll and the ship has lost its deck and superstructure, particularly at the bow and stern, where almost everything above the seabed has disappeared. As a result, you're seeing the insides of the ship here. And if I say the bow is up here, and the stern is up here, and this is in the middle amidships. And these are the four boilers that produce steam for the engines and whose flooding doom the ship. Um, you can see the faintest outline of the hull at the bow and stern, where it's just about sticking up from the seabed. The rest of it has disappeared. So what survives in these areas is just the bottom of the hull, the very bottom of the hull, sunk into the sand and gravel seabed by the weight of the ship when it sank. Now, because it's buried, you'll have to take my word for it that not much is actually buried and that the Lelia also has a flat bottom. The bow would have been about here, the stern about there. And that means that this ship is not only very small, but also very long and thin. Characteristics that we normally associate with the need for high speed. Now, evidence was given to the inquiry into the loss of the ship that the Lelia could make over 15 knots. Now, that sounds rather pedestrian now, but in the 1860s, it would have made it one of the fastest ships in the world. Thank you for watching part one of our Heritage Talk. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Exploring the archaeology of the American Civil War.